You know, I appreciate it so much, the words of Sean talking about happiness and how happiness can be found in many different forms and shapes and places. And happiness can come out of pain. Happiness can come out of suffering. In suffering and pain, we can see happiness if we choose to. I would like everybody that's got their bottle of Fulfill Your Destiny, take it out of your pocket, and I'd like you to put a couple of drops in the palm of your hand and rub it around and cup it over your nose and breathe in, fulfill your destiny. And while you're doing that, I want you to close your eyes and I'd like you to visualize where you want your destiny to take you. And what you would like to see, how you'd like to see that look like. And in health, in finances, in emotions, in spirituality, see what that looks like to you. And then, for example, if there's one person here tonight that has a financial struggle or a couple, see yourself living outside of struggle. See yourself living in grace and ease and happiness. If you're needing better health, See yourself already healthy. See yourself doing the things that maybe you can't do right now. And feel what it feels like to be able to do what you maybe are limited and can't do at the moment. Because what we put in here and how we articulate that information up here between our ears in that space determines the outcome of where we're going tomorrow. And it may not happen. Your vision, your desires may not happen tomorrow. It may not happen next week. It may not happen next month. But if you believe in who you are and you believe there's a God in heaven, then you can change it. Today is a very special day for me in so many ways because on November the 15th, six months earlier on June the 15th, I was told that I would be lucky if I lived six months. And so on June the, or November the 15th, I turned over to Mary in bed that morning and I said, Honey, how does it feel to be in bed with a dead man? <laughs> You don't have to put up with or believe anything you're told unless you want to. In the past year, Mary's been told more than four times, five times that I wouldn't live. And again, just April, this past April. So I am here and I'm feeling better than I've felt in several years. And I'm not going to tell you how many gallons of oil I've drank. But I'm a human diffuser and when I walk, I don't squeak. Okay? And it hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy. But has it been worth it? Yes. yes. Have I had days that I wanted to quit? Yes. Have I had days of depression? Yes, I'm a human being. And those are things that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and you fight them if you want the right outcome. And you put them behind you and you find ways to deal with it. And there's some days that you just don't find a way to deal with it. And on those days you just take it all in and you say, okay, this is not really at the top of my game today, but I'm gonna get through this day and tomorrow will be a different day. And sometimes you don't have the resources, mentally, physically, spiritually, to fight that day. So just sit back and give yourself permission that it's okay. Because if you don't, you will fight harder and harder and what you resist will persist. Okay? I didn't learn all of this overnight. And my family has been through a lot of uncomfortable moments because of my bad attitude when I would get down. 
And I know what it's like, I've been there several times, but this past year was the worst. So I started looking at ways that I could fix it, things that I could do that would make things better. How and what can I do to live with this until it's better? Because things don't always change in the moment. So that I'd like to share with you now. My presentation is how to become successful in two weeks. Is anybody interested? Well, it went by that fast. <laughs> Try that again. There we go. Capture an idea and dream about it. Now, this is where you can start taking control of your negative thoughts and your negative emotions. And this is where I would go when I would start feeling like just giving up because I had all these doctors telling me it was impossible. We had three doctors in Houston tell Mary and I and Mark, my pilot, that I should have been dead four different times. Well, what do they know about dying? Okay, that's an individual thing. You want to get out of that mindset. You capture an idea and you dream about it. You dream about it until that's all you see. And then talk about your idea with your family and friends. And maybe it's about, hey, I want to be a royal crown diamond or I want to be a gold. Talk to your family and friends. Why do you talk to your family and friends first? Because you want to get the negativity past you. All right? You want to get all of the, that's crazy. I've never heard anything so foolish. That multi-level stuff, that pyramid stuff, why would you want to do that? So you want to get that out of the way. And then you can start focusing forward. Study that idea in your mind and rehearse it and look at it and analyze it, scrutinize it. And then you start putting a plan to that idea of how you're going to do it. How you're going to do it. Now, if you're actively engaging your brain in doing this, you know what your brain is not doing? It's not telling you to give up. It's not telling you to feel sorry for yourself. It's not telling you it's impossible. It's not telling you the doctor's right. You're focusing your brain on an idea that's outside of yourself that's bigger than you. And then do research about it. For example, if you're looking at being a gold or a crown or a royal, research and learn all you can about the aspects of being that person and what it takes to get there. Study your business, study the market, look at the pitfalls, look at the negative things, look at everything. Because that's how you make a firm decision of what you really want to do with your life. It doesn't matter what it is, whether you're buying a franchise from Nampa Auto Parts or you're going to be a Royal Crown Diamond. It's the same principles, okay? Now some people would say, whoops, I missed something here. What stops us from building a business? What stops us from being successful? Changing my paradigm. Changing my belief system. Changing how I see myself. Do I see myself being successful or do I see myself going down to the welfare office and getting food stamps? <laughs> changing my outcome by changing how I see myself. Some would say it's fear that keeps us from doing this. And I say no, it's not fear. I've heard people say the greatest fear is public speaking. If that were true, I wouldn't be up here on this stage. All right. Public speaking is not the greatest fear. You know what the greatest fear is? The reality is, it is taking the risk to change your paradigm. How many here want to change your paradigm? Yes. Okay. How many are willing to take a risk? Thank you. Okay. Is the risk worth it? What if I take the risk and it doesn't work out? Do I risk losing my friends? Do I risk losing my marriage? Do I risk everything financially? Do I risk getting hurt physically or mentally? 
could I decide that it is not worth the risk? And yes, you can decide it's not worth the risk. And unfortunately, many of us at different times in our life make the decision it's not worth the risk. And so we don't do it. We set back and become disappointed the very next year when we discover we're in the same place, doing the same thing, having the same thoughts, regretting our life. Is this a risk? Yeah, that's a risk. Is this a risk? Yes, it's a risk. Is it worth it? Well, it's a moment of impact. I would have to say no. But the reality of it is, yes. The long term, it was worth it. It even cost me $28,000 to put my car back together. But you know how much nitro we sold after that? Yes, this was after the rollover you just viewed. You notice my flags are gone, my lights gone off the roof. But we just, after seven rolls, John Wetton, the cameraman, and a couple of others, his assistants, came running down the mountain, helped me roll the car back up on its wheels, and fired it up and go again. You don't quit because you have a little rollover. Okay? So yes, you have a choice. You can quit right there because it hurt a little bit, or you can forget the hurt and get on with having fun and being happy, right? This was another moment that produced a little bit of pain. It resulted in a broken back. There's a risk in doing research. There's a risk in everything you do. There's a risk in getting out of bed in the morning. There's a risk in hiking into the jungle looking for plants. The real Babanasa between Ecuador and Colombia. Looking for plants for who? Us. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. This was going up a tributary off the Amazon River in Peru looking for more plants. This was the week that I got bit and wound up with the Chagas virus. There is a risk. There's a risk in everything. And there's a, whoops. Whoops. <laughs> there we go. That's Jacob, it's all airborne. We love playing. And there's a risk in playing, but you know what? The spectators right here were at a bigger risk. Oh, no. That was Mary right there in that snowmobile. <laughs> she was more scared than I was. <laughs> yes, you take risk in many ways. And maybe some of you don't take risk quite as much as I do or in ways that I do, but I'll be glad to share it with you and teach you how. There's a risk in coming to Young Living's Convention, true or false? You might get addicted to Young Living. Yes. Dr. Anthony Campolo conducted a study in which he interviewed 50 people over the age of 95, asking them, if you could live life over again, what would you do differently? And you know what? It was very interesting. The three most common responses were, I would reflect more often on my choices. How many of you here tonight can think of that and think of how you could have made more productive choices and things that you've done in the past? All of us can, right? Absolutely. I would do more things that would live on after I'm dead. But the third one, I would take more risk. How many of you are ready to take more risk in becoming successful? Okay. I get tired 
from just thinking of everything I have to do. <laughs> Capture an idea and dream about it. You can write these things down if you would like, because this is how to become successful. Talk about your idea with family and friends. Learn everything you can. This is on January the 11th of this year. It was New Year's Day that I called Mitch Seavey and asked him if I came to Alaska, if he could let me take a dog team and take a ride and see if he thought I might be able to do this. And I have to tell you how this came about a little bit. I was laying in bed after Christmas and I had this feeling, I need to get out of this space I'm in. I've got to, I've got to make a change because it's eating me alive inside mentally because of the condition I was physically. And I knew that if I didn't get out of that mindset, how destructive it was going to be. And so I thought of the most crazy thing I could think of in December. And I rolled over in bed and I told Mary, I said, what would you think if I went to Alaska racing dogs? And she was very kind. She looked at me and says, have you lost your flippin' mind? Ah, <laughs> uh -uh, uh uh not at all. So I was very politically correct. I said, okay. She felt safe. After breakfast, we're sitting around the table. I said to my boys, Jacob, Joseph, what would you think of Dad going to Alaska racing dogs? Yeah, Dad, that's cool! Well, I had three votes. What could she say? You see, guys, don't argue with your sweetheart. Just find a politically correct way to reframe it. Okay? So, January the 11th, I went to Alaska to learn. Find someone who's successful and watch, listen, and ask questions. And that's what I did. Watch and duplicate their success. And that happens to be me there in the blue coat behind, following my leader. Follow their example and duplicate them until you develop your own style. And every one of us has our own personality. We have our own feelings. We have our own way of doing things. We can't copy the next person, but what we can do is learn from them until we create our way of doing it. All right? Follow the example of leaders. This is what's really critical in building your business. And this was something that was very profound for me. Because Mitch said to me, he says, Gary, you need to get to know your dogs that you're gonna be racing with. So they turned the dogs, my team loose in this big pen. And I walked in and I'm walking around, here boy, here boy. And they just ran around me like, who are you? They never paid one lick of attention to me. And I thought, wow, this is really gonna be successful. They don't care who I am. And no matter what I said to them, how I called them, coached them, they wouldn't come to me. And so I just knelt down in the snow. I thought, well, I just kneel down in the snow and see what happens. And the minute I did, the dogs came right up to me. Folks, here's a real fundamental secret. Get down on the level of your people. Okay? Get down on their level. So you're not intimidating to them. You're not a threat to them because you're this big successful diamond or gold or platinum or silver or executive and you know so much more than the new person you're talking to know what they need, what their needs are, what they want. You take an interest in them and show them how much you care about them and they will come to you. And that's what I did with the dogs. What a beautiful lesson it was. Okay, the next thing. Whoops. Develop a relationship of trust. If your people don't trust you, where do you think it's gonna take you? And this is how I felt with my friends. Look at that dog. He looked up to me like, can I really trust to go out in the cold and the wilderness with you? He had to have that trust. 
I had to have the trust in him because that team of dogs was going to take me two, three hundred miles out in the wilderness in Alaska. And all kinds of things could happen. You must build trust through developing relationships. And folks, this is one of the things that I will say. I think social media is fabulous, but I think in some ways it's destructive because for some of us, we've stopped building those one-on-one -on -one relationships. You want to keep your business growing. You want to hold the people to you. Build one-on-one -on -one relationships and build that trust and they will never leave you. Now we're ready to take action. We've got all the ingredients put together. But no matter where you go, no matter what you've learned, no matter if you are a royal crown diamond, always be coachable. Always be coachable. Be teachable. Be humble. Always. Don't be afraid. Just do it and trust yourself. You'll make mistakes just like I did. You know, my first corner, I hit a tree. Because I didn't even know how to drive a sled. You know, you're going to have times that you're going to hit bumps and you're going to find out, wow, this is, this is horrible. How can I keep doing this when it's not working for me? Did I roll over the sled? Of course I rolled over the sled. I hit a couple of more trees, but I didn't quit. I broke three ribs while training at my ranch in Utah, three days prior to the race in Alaska. But this didn't stop me. So a little owie, a little hurt, that's not a reason to quit. Because folks, if you quit because you feel a little pain, what are you going to do when it gets painful? Think about it. You might hear yourself say, I can't do this. When I was out there on the trail like this and it was cold and dark, I heard Mary's voice over and over and over. Honey, you don't have to do this. <laughs> you keep practicing. If you talk to someone and they say, well, I'm not interested in young living, it's okay. That's not where you stop. You keep practicing. It may not be the right time for them. I had a beautiful lady here at convention a couple days ago tell me that she got introduced to the oils years ago. And she felt kind of bad that she didn't do anything until three years ago. And I said, no, don't feel bad. It's the right time for you. Timing is everything. You don't quit. You don't give up. Now you're ready. You must believe in yourself. Okay, know where you're going and be ready for what's ahead. So in this case, I looked at the map, I studied the route that I was going to be racing. So I'd have a little bit of idea of the elevations and the changes and we're out here in the, in the Alaska bush. The whole race, not just part of it. So we went all the way down to Homer and then turned around and went all the way back 200 miles. This is another part that's really critical. After you've studied it out and you understand where you're going and you've created your map of how you're going to build your business, make your commitment and don't doubt yourself or you will fail. And this is the thing because I kept hearing these voices in my head. Gary, what about your heart? Gary, what about your lungs? Gary, this is crazy. You're going to be out there in the wilderness 200 miles from nowhere and there's nobody around. Do you realize what could happen? And your head will do that to you. You have to decide if you're in control or your head's in control. True or false? Okay? So if your cousin, brother, aunt, friend across the street says, you're crazy, you can't do this. You have a choice. You can either accept it or you can just say, forget it, I'm doing it anyway. You know, I had a choice. We all have choices. It's how we act upon our choice that's going to determine whether we're successful or not. So I went and walked right in and I signed up. You know, if you hesitate, you'll start thinking about all the fear. You'll be thinking about the risk. You'll be thinking about, 
Holy cow, Gary, are you stupid? You've only been on a dog sled seven times in your life? And you're gonna go run a race in a country you've never even been in? You don't even know the terrain? And you've got all of these health problems? Of course I could go that way. I signed up and I just did it. If you want to succeed, get in the race and don't look back. Okay? It doesn't matter what people tell you. You're in charge of your life. Nobody else is. And yes, that doesn't mean you can't discuss your thoughts and that with them, but ultimately it's your choice. Mary talked to me and talked to me and talked to me. And I'm sure she thought that I was 100% deaf, not just partially. Because I didn't listen to her. Honey, you don't need to do this. Honey, you could be writing a book instead of doing this. Honey, do you know you could be making other forms? Honey, you could do, honey, honey. Well, she had so many honey do's. Of course I could. Was this going to do anything towards building Young Living? Nobody thought it would. <laughs> this was a scary moment. And you want to know why it was a scary moment? Because the musher, with a 20-year history of mushing, was right in front of me, and she rolled her sled at the start. And I'm coming up there, never been on a race in my life. I've only been on a dog sled seven times. And I thought, holy criminy, Gary. Are you absolutely crazy? Here's a professional musher that just rolled her sled in the takeoff. Once you start, just keep looking forward. January the 28th, 11.40 a.m., I was out of the chute. The people didn't even know me, and they were cheering and clapping and yelling. It was an exhilarating feeling. And those dogs were... They knew they had a greenhorn in the back of that sled, and they were heck bent for election to get rid of me before they got a mile down the trail. It's intimidating to start something new, not knowing what to expect. How many of you distributors have felt that? Of course, yes. Who cares? Who cares? Okay? If you want something bad enough, you go for it. You don't worry about anything else. You don't worry about it's intimidating to you. You just grab on to those bars and stay clenched into your purpose and you just go for it. I went through this chute, as I call it, and around an S-turn, and there was a road we had to go up over, and it was frozen. I'm on the brake trying to slow these dogs down. They're so pumped up. They're so excited. They got this green horn on the back, and they know they're going to get rid of him. And they're booking it. And they come up, and I see this road. It's a, a berm like this. And I see them coming, and I'm trying to get down on their brake and slow that sled down. They hit that berm. It felt like at 100 miles an hour. And Sled and Gary was airborne for 30 feet. Oh, wow. Do you think that old heart got a workout that time? <laughs> you better believe it. Now comes the time. I'm out here on my own, all alone. Going through the Alaska wilderness. I don't know where I'm at. I don't know how far I am. But I've been mushing for hours and hours and hours. I looked down at my GPS and I scrubbed the frost off from it so I could see, and it said 5.9. Holy crime, I've only gone 5.9 miles? I've been out here all day, and I only have 50 miles to go. So I'm going and going and going for another hour or so. I brush off the frost, I look at it, 6.1. I'm never going to get to that check station. I started feeling so down, so deflated that I had been out here for hours. I didn't have a watch on. I wasn't paying attention at the time. I just saw the sun just move around and go down. And I'm still out in the middle of Alaska, nowhere, and I've only gone 6.1 miles. And I think, this, this is impossible. I can't do this. 
No one told me it was going to be this difficult as I had to get off the sled and run with the dogs up the hill because it was a little too much for this young team of puppies. They were two-year-olds and it was perhaps their first race. And I started up over this hill and as I came over the hill, the sun was just going down and at this moment I saw a man standing there with a camera and it was John Wetton. Uh, there's only one way John could be here. The check station has got to be around the corner. <laughs> oh my goodness, I was felt so excited. I was just on high. I came around the corner into the check station and folks, here's another secret for you. Achieving your first goal, if it's a star or executive or silver or whatever it is, when you achieve that goal, it gives you a certain amount of excitement inside. It charges your adrenaline. That is for the purpose of giving you that shot for the next goal. And here's the key. Always make your next goal bigger than the one you just accomplished. Okay? Please do that. So arriving at Fetty's check station 52 miles into the race, Saturday afternoon, January the 28th. And it was amazing. It was amazing. Because as I pulled in the check station, the officials that were there to check my time and check my dogs and make sure that I made it okay, you know, they were just making a big fuss about me arriving there. And I thought, well, this was really strange, but boy, what wonderful people. How cool is it that they're so excited about me coming in second to last? I didn't know that some of them had been placing bets I wouldn't make it. <laughs> so now is the time to put my dogs down, feed them, and get ready for the night. And enjoy the three hours of downtime you've got, four hours, whatever it might be. And it takes about an hour and a half to get the dogs down, get their booties off, get them on the steak line, cook the food for them, get them fed, and you've got maybe two hours left, and you've got to keep in mind you've got to get up and re-hornness, re-booty, get them off the snake line, get them hitched up to your sled, and get ready to go. And that's going to take 45 minutes to an hour. So how much downtime do you have? Oh, you got an hour. Oh, this is exciting. I got an hour to go to sleep. So you grab your bedroll, and you go over to the check station, and you find out there's a place for you to sleep. You walk into the building, and there's a great big huge cat generator running. Oh. No sleep. So now it's back on the trail again. And folks, running through the night had a whole different feeling to it. What you see there is all that you see is what's in that headlight. And it was nice if it reached the front dogs. And it was so many times that I'd be going and I learned a little secret. When the dogs had come up to a hill, when the ears of the first dog would disappear just like that, I call that a one-ear hill. When two dogs' ears were showing before they disappeared, that was a two-ear hill. If it was three dogs' ears that were showing before they disappeared, that was a three-ear hill. I learned real quick that when you came to a one-ear hill, you got on that brake and you hung on for life, and you might as well close your eyes because then it's gonna matter. You're either gonna wind upside down, wrapped around a tree, or you're gonna wind up in the bottom. But when those dogs went over that hill, they'd look back at me and stick their tongue out and laugh at me. Hang on, dude, we're going for a ride. And we did. This is fully into the next check station. Did I get tired? Yes. And when you're building a business, there may be times that you'll get tired too, and you'll want to take a rest. No, I've not slept well. Why do you ask? Well, the next morning, getting my dogs up, getting my ready to go. And folks, just as quick as I got to my sled and got the things out to give my dogs their breakfast and get them hooked off the stake line into the gang line, the storm moved in and it started to snow. And before I could get everything ready and get my clothes on to run, we had four inches of snow on the ground. And it was chilly. A lot of reasons to quit. Going downhill is not always easy. No. 
because you don't want to run over the person in front of you. You don't want the one behind you to run over you. So you got to keep your distance. Coming into the second check station. Wow. Or the third check station. What a glorious experience and a feeling it was. And you know what I found out when I was in the second check station? Four other mushers had quit because of the conditions and how harsh and hard it was. And they were seasoned mushers. You know, so sometimes a very knowledgeable person might come along and say, you're crazy. I've done this. I've been down this trail before. And it isn't a good place to go. You know, I've built multi-level company before. I had a business in multi -level, And it, I would never do it again. And folks, we have a tendency to listen to those things. Never, never, never. Because those are dream stealers. And that's why I made your oil blend dream catcher. You want to be grabbing dreams instead of letting somebody steal your dreams. Right? And here again, this is my third accomplishment. Wow, I felt like I could conquer the world. You can't imagine what that feeling did to this old heart that was all busted up. And you know the best part that I didn't expect? And the reason I had my hands in the air cheering is because my two sons and my sweetheart were waiting at that check station for me. Yes. When my sweetheart knew that I was committed to do this, she didn't push back anymore. She says, honey, if this is what you want to do, then let's do it. And she jumped in and gave me the support. And it was a wonderful feeling. This is coming in. The joy of accomplishment. You've all felt the joy of accomplishment. It's true or false? Yes. Three days and nights out on the trail. We had temperatures down to 10, 14 below zero. It was chilly, and then there was the wind chill factor that went along with that. There's Joseph running alongside of me. <laughs> Sharing your success with others is immensely rewarding. There's Joseph, Jacob, and Mary in line, so you see the preferential rewards. <laughs> and uh, yes, it was a joy. Mitch's wife, Janine, was there. They were there to greet me. It was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. And then here's the payday. So we go to the banquet that night, and I got a check for $250 for finishing that race. Wow! Woo! Man, that was such an exhilarating feeling. There's Nick CV on the right. You know, our, I did a three-time I did a ride champion, and the man who coached me and inspired me to give this a go. And so it was a wonderful time. That's Patrick. He came in last, so he got the red lantern. But I told Jared, I said, Jared, I got a new career. I made money doing this. <laughs> so yes, it was fun. But it was, I was so stoked. The boys wanted to go play the next day, so we went to the ski resort and went skiing the next day. You know, you don't just lay down because you make an accomplishment. You don't lay down because you're tired. You keep going. If you want to be successful, you keep going. The second race, the Willow 300 Mushers meeting, February the 3rd. And here's my dogs. We're getting ready to go. I'm getting my sled packed and ready. The dogs are excited. This is their destiny. They love to run. They love to perform. This is the most exciting thing for these Huskies that they can do in their life. If their passion to run is like your passion being here at convention. And to take that away from them would be totally wrong. Here the other mushers are lined up as we're getting ready to take off. The starting line at Willow. This is also the starting point for the 1,050 mile Iditarod run. And now I'm back in the wilderness again with my dogs. And when you're standing on those runners, and you're going along about 8 to 10 miles an hour, and it's 10, 20, below, whatever, and the wind is blowing on that open, across those frozen lakes and tundra, it gives you a lot of time to think. And, oh, that picture I was really proud of. That was my very first selfie. <laughs> And here I was crossing what was called Big Lake, 
frozen lake and the dogs were lined out and going well and I tried this out and I sent it home and oh, that was pretty exciting. <laughs> Mushing into the unknown. Another thing that I learned, how many of you have felt like you've gone into the unknown with Young Living? The difference between you mushing into Young Living and where I was mushing is there was nobody in front of me and there was nobody behind me except for a ways. But there was nobody there I could talk to. And, and Mitch, he said to me, he says, Gary, he said, you know, we have a lot of trouble with moose on the trail when the snow's is deep and they attack the dog teams. You know, we knew there was wolves there. One night when I was mushing, I saw these eyes following me in the trees. Kind of get your blood pumping a little bit. But here I'm coming up on a hill, pitch black. And as you can see, my headlamp just reaches the lead dogs. I don't know what's over that hill. I don't know how steep that hill is. I don't know how crooked that trail is going down that other side. I don't know if there's a grizzly bear in a trail, or a pack of wolves, or an angry moose on the other side of that hill. Folks, when you're building your business in Young Living, you're gonna have several unknown spaces. And these are times when people will pull back and they'll wanna, ah, you know, maybe I need to rethink this. Maybe I better watch somebody else do it first. No, that's not what you do. Successful people don't do that. You reach inside of you and you feel your heart, can I do this? And when your brain says, uh-uh, you're plumb nuts, that's when you do it, okay? You just do it. Here <laughs> stopping one night and getting my fire going so I could feed my dogs, and this night was 10 below zero. <laughs> And I got my sleeping bag out, laid it down there beside my sled. There's my dogs at 10 below zero, and I took a 45-minute nap. Now, why didn't I sleep longer? Because 45 minutes, I was froze. And it woke me up, and it was time to go again. Alaska whiteout, when you can't see ahead, quitting feels like a good idea. And you can see there, as I was going across that one big lake, I don't remember the name of it, just out of Willow Ways, the fog settled in, there was a light wind that was just blowing that frozen, crystallized snow, and that was all I could see. I couldn't even see my wheel dogs, which are my first two dogs. I couldn't even see them clearly. And I've got ten more ahead of them. I can't even see them. And then I would hear more Mary's voice, Honey, you don't have to do this. <laughs> There's other things you could be doing. And folks, you're going to be in that space. You're going to be saying to yourself, uh, no, I could go get a job at McDonald's. And I know there'd be a paycheck there every two weeks. No, I could get a job as a computer programmer. I could get a job as an attorney helping Matt. You know, all kinds of things that you would be able to say and do that would convince you not to do it. And I heard those voices. I'm into my second race, my fourth day with basically no sleep. I was frozen. I felt like a popsicle standing there riding with my dogs. I would get off at different times and I would run beside the sled until my heart would just about give out to try to get the blood going, get the circulation so I could get warm enough because I thought I was going to freeze. And yes, in those times, your head will play games with you. And they will convince you to quit. They'll give you every reason to quit. And I even entertain those ideas, and you can entertain them if you know who you are. And I'm sitting on those, or standing on those runners going across that big frozen lake, colder than I'll get out with the wind blowing, and can't see anything. Pitch black as black can get. And I'm saying, yeah, you know, if I quit right now, nobody would fault me. Right? Right. 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 Mary would be happy. 
she would jump up and down with joy because I had enough sense to quit. <laughs> but there was two little things that just came in this side of the brain. And one was, but Gary, how would you explain that to Jacob and Joseph? And then the next one was, how would you explain that to all of your distributors if you quit? Because you're not a quitter. So here's the key. When you get to that point where you feel like you can't do it anymore, then you find a reason. You reach down inside of you and you find a reason to do it. Even if you have to fabricate a reason to keep you pushing and persevering forward, you don't quit. Okay? And I even, at one point, as I was alone out there, not knowing what was happening, I could feel my heart was doing things it wasn't supposed to do, and the thoughts did cross my mind. I could die, and nobody would even know where I was at, because two different times I missed the trail and had to stop and go back and turn my dogs and get back on the trail. And if I was out on one of those other they would not find me maybe for a day or two, who knows. Those thoughts went through my mind. And this is what I did to myself. I said, Gary, you're going to do this if you do die. You're not quitting. Because if you die, you're going to be an example to your boys that you don't quit just because it gets difficult. You don't quit. So when life knocks you down, roll over and look at the stars. This is pulling into the Yetna check station. Arriving at Yetna checkpoint, 8.27 a.m. February the 5th, the temperature was 15 below zero. And the wind, I don't remember how what the wind was, but it was over 10 mile an hour wind. That's why I had that white uh, jacket on to, as a windbreaker. Here I'm cooking, getting ready to feed my dogs again. You take care of your dogs. You take care of your people. You take care of those who help you to achieve success. This is not about just us as a person. This is about everybody around us. Out there on that trail, it was about me and my dogs. I had to take care of them first because if I didn't, they're not gonna take care of me. Folks, if you don't take care of the people in your organization, then why should they take care of you? You show them how much you love them so they can sleep at night, all right? And they will take care of you. And yes, let them know how much you care about them. Coddle them a little bit. It's okay to show somebody you love them. This is one of my lead dogs and he was just a precious dog. And I rewarded them every day. Arriving the Dishka Landing Checkpoint Sunday evening, 6.30 p.m. February the 5th. And coming in again, as I came around the corner, there was J Joseph. Whoa! Man, all of those problems, all of those bad thoughts, they just vanished. <laughs> they just vanished. And Joseph was there, Jared, Janae, Matt, Lori, Mark, the film crew. What a rewarding feeling it was when I came into that checkpoint and they were all there to greet me. And then, I had three hours of downtime, it was hitch up and go again. Putting booties on. Here, my carabiner was frozen solid. I had a bead on it to get it loose so I could open it up, get my snow hooks hooked up. And then it's running through the night again. Now here's something that's very, very interesting that I learned again. I think will have tremendous value to everybody. We live, yeah, that was coming into the check station. We live in a world today where there's no quiet. Our minds are just full of data. We're data overload. We're busy constantly. Our minds are taking in all kinds of information. And how do we process it? How do we process it? One of the value things that I found out here on the trail in the cold and the lonely, quiet, all you're hearing is the crunching of the sleigh runners in the snow, the pitter-patter of the dog's feet in the snow, occasionally a bark, occasionally a howl. 
but you're just there for hour after hour after hour, hanging on and hoping you don't have a rollover and get wrapped around a tree or go over the bank or into a river. All kinds of challenges. But you have time to think because it's quiet. It's quiet. Folks, to be successful, we need quiet time. We need to disconnect from the world. This is where I disconnected because I need to go get my mind straight. I need to get my mind off all the problems and all the people telling me I was going to die. This wouldn't work, that wouldn't work, or this or that, until I was just, I was almost going crazy with it. I knew I had to get someplace where it was quiet to think and sharpen my saw. And this is where that can happen. And there's such a feeling out there in the cold wilderness with the dogs. You develop such a relationship. You just develop such a association and a companionship. And I thought, if we could do this with our people in our organizations, wow, what a powerful company we would be. And if we took time to step back and reflect and be quiet and listen to the un spoken words and sharpen our saw, how much more productive could we be? How much more could we help others? Planning is the compass for success. Thank you. Whoops. Getting ready to get back on the trail after a three hour stop to feed and rest the dogs again. Planning is the compass for success. This is something that I feel I've done it in my life where I haven't planned well. And I understand and I know the pitfalls of that. But to be a successful person at anything, we need to learn how to plan and plan efficiently. So I'm miles and miles from nowhere. And I open up my sleigh and if I don't have the right things in here, I'm in big trouble. If I don't have the right amount of food for my dogs, my dogs are in trouble. If they're in trouble, I'm really in trouble. If I don't have an ax, if I don't have fire starter, if I don't have a sleeping bag, if I don't have snowshoes and a snowstorm moves in, what's going to happen? I won't be able to put them on and break trail for my dogs if I have to. Planning is the key in everything. Take time to plan how you're going to build your business and how you're going to be successful. Now, you can have interruptions. So I'm here, it's 17 below this morning, and I'm cold. I've been on the trail now for almost six days to all together, and I'm tired. My bones are frozen. My bones are aching. My heart is doing things it shouldn't do. And I'm having a challenge keeping my head straight. And Mary shows up with the phone in her hand and said, honey, could you talk to these distributors? Uh, <laughs> what? I've got to get the booties on my dogs. I've got a race I'm running and you want me to stop and talk to distributors? Of course I will. And I did. So I told her, I said, you hold the phone so I can keep putting booties on my dogs and you just walk with me and I will talk to them. And I did. Here's another lesson. You're never too busy to give to somebody. Okay? You're never too busy to give to someone. Because you don't know who's on the other end. You don't know what it will mean to them. Yes, it may be a sacrifice for you. This was very difficult in the situation I was in at that moment. I've got a race to win. I don't have time to talk to some distributors. Yes, I do. And yes, I did. And I always will. You have time for your people, okay? Yes, it's cold, 25 below. This could have been a reason to give up. A very, very big reason to give up. Coming out of the last check station, headed for the finishing line. That morning we hit 27 below. 
And this gentleman, I don't even know who he was, as I'm coming into the finishing station, or the finishing line about three, four miles out, he was on the side of the trail, and he just reached out and gave me a high five and says, Gary, you can do it! I don't know who it was. Wow! Man, my heart just about went up in my throat. That just one little thing just changed everything. That's what you need to do to your people. Give them a high five. Make them know that you believe in them. Support them in their challenges in life, in their opportunities of being in Young Living and Building. This was so powerful to me. And we don't do it enough. True or false? True. Yes. But we can change it all. Experiencing failure and pain is a price we pay for character. Yes, my hands were frozen, frostbite, just part of the learning experience. Is that a reason to quit? No, it wasn't a reason to quit. This is coming across Willow Lake towards the finishing line. Oh, what another exciting moment. And look at my dog. Don't they look happy? It was a happy moment for me. A brand new newbie that took on two races in Alaska that had never raced a dog, never run a dog before. And I finished two races and brought all my dogs home. because I took care of them, and they took care of me. And I didn't know beans about what I was doing, except the few hours that Mitch had in prepping me and getting me ready for this, I knew nothing. I just went for it. And folks, that is how you become successful. This is the finishing line. You can see Mitch standing there on the other side of me, Mary right behind me there. Jared is there taking video that went all over the world. Some of you might have seen it. There's Joseph giving me a big hug. The rewards. There's Janae video recording, Matt hugging me. You know, my team was there supporting me. They flew all the way up from Utah to be there at the finishing line to support me. What do you think that made me feel like? Like I had value, like I had self-worth. Like I meant something to them other than just their boss. And that's what you need to do to all of your people. Make them feel that there's something special. I can't tell you in enough words how special my team made me feel when I came across that lake to the finish line and they were all there to greet me. I knew the sacrifices they made to fly up there on a commercial flight and drive 150 miles from Anchorage to be at that finishing line. Yes, sometimes all it takes is just giving a little bit to change another person's life and perspective. You give to the people in your organization and they'll be there for you. We can always find excuses and reasons to give up and quit. It's easy to stay in a rut struggling through life, paying bills and supporting a family. It's easy to remain in the status quo of mediocrity. Be willing to take the path less traveled. Be willing to change. How many here tonight are ready to change? Thank you. This adventure changed my life. It was one of the highlights in my life, and not so much as the activity as it was the lessons that I learned from it, and the opportunity to develop a relationship with some beautiful animals. Be willing to take a risk. 
How many of you are willing to take a risk tonight? Are you ready to change your paradigm? Are you ready for success? Well, stand up and let's see it.